Well, thanks for having me here. And um, I'm very pleased and I have to admit a bit overwhelmed by, by such an audience. Um, tonight, I would like to, to share uh, a few thoughts on Herodotus and cultural history. And I'm also very excited about the discussion and I look forward to it. I should perhaps add that what I'm presenting today is part of a larger project in which my aim is to present Herodotus as an author who is politically and literarily, shall we say, avant-garde. Um, my book on the subject will probably be published in, in, in the autumn, so perhaps this little advertisement is permitted. I also thought long and hard about whether I should integrate uh, the political aspect tonight, which seems to me to be very central to Herodotus, even more strongly. But that would have been a very long lecture, so I will therefore limit myself to the announced topic and speak for more or less uh, half an hour. As we all know, um, Herodotus histories is one of the most interesting examples of a text that helped found a new literary genre. The histories have been enormously influential, not only in terms of their content, but also by shaping history as a genre. There are notorious and long-standing problems with identifying the precise genre of Herodotus's work. As Robert Fowler, Rosalind Thomas, Emily, and others have shown, Herodotus combines geographical, ethnographical, ethnological, scientific, rhetorical, legal, and technical material. Some scholars, including Martin Hose, for example, Carolyn DeWalt, and Deborah Bodica, have suggested that Herodotus's histories should not be referred to as a historical text at all, but as a work sui generis. And I agree. Herodotus' histories are, if anything, a kind of proto-historiographical text. However, it is worth asking whether the numerous facets of the work I just mentioned, and which seem to comprise a certain scientific and legal focus, in fact, fully cover the scope of what is contained in this remarkable text. So I would like to invite you to take a closer look at the histories and see what kind of text we are dealing with. Even though Cicero in a famous passage already calls Herodotus the father of history, pictured here, Herodotus's work is more than a proto-history. The text is also something of an early monument of engagement with older literary and non-literary traditions. In contrast to Greek epic, in which we can observe adoption of numerous motifs from the ancient Near East, which, for example, among others, Martin West and Walter Burkhead have drawn attention in their groundbreaking studies. And I could also mention Robert Dollinger. Bernhard Blichler, Josef Wieselhofer, and so on and so on. In Herodotus, we see conscious engagement with Greek and non-Greek traditions, not only literary, but also architectural, historical, philosophical, theological, and religious. For example, in the second book, Herodotus claims that the Greeks um, only learned the names of the other gods uh, which came to them from Egypt. Here we see an interesting example and an early evidence of the appropriation of foreign religious ideas, as well as a relatively rare case of ancient reflection on the practice of cultural adoption. On closer inspection, and this is what my paper is all about, Herodotus's history of the Persian Wars is in fact a cultural history of the Persian Wars, a story in which questions of cultural contact play a key role. Herodotus is interested not only in the relationship between Greeks and non-Greeks, 
but also in the relationship among non-Greeks, above all, of course, among Persians and Egyptians and the inhabitants of the ancient Near East. The relations of cultural dependence Herodotus describes are complex. But what, to begin with, does the term cultural history mean in relation to Herodotus' text? In Herodotus, cultural contexts are not simply described. They are also problematized and employed to gain better understanding of one's own culture. They are problematized, for example, in cases where cultural appropriation fails, as in the case of Sisythian Anachartus. They are employed for the purposes of self-reflection when the other and the foreign is used as a mirror of one's own culture. François Artoc and others have demonstrated this in detail, focusing especially on the example of the Scythian logos. Finally, cultural contexts play a role in the many digressions in which the narrator describes countless cultural details in a manner reminiscent of periplus and periegetic literature, ranging from the Mediterranean to Babylon, Egypt, Persia, and Lydia to the Black Sea or Cyprus. The Herodotian text thus introduces a Greek audience to other cultures and opens up new cultural, geographical, and of course, historical landscapes. To echo the title of Daniel Kehlmann's novel, and I realize that it has been translated into English, so I hope that at least some of you know um, the story, Herodotus measures the world in a new and different way making the polis its center and surveying the horizon of experience and action from there. Herodotus's pioneering achievement consists in grasping the contemporary world both externally, that is from the point of view of culture, and internally according to its laws of action. In doing so, like Kielmann's protagonists, he opens the world up anew in both geographical and cultural terms. Furthermore, in addition to opening up new geographical, historical, and cultural landscapes, Herodotus's histories also reveal new literary horizons. This lends Herodotus's text a novel, I would say, to a certain extent even experimental character. As far as I can see, this aspect of opening up of new literary space is still underexplored, even though it was a great pleasure for me to see the marvelous volume by uh, Ivan Matijaric with the chapters by you, Jan, and you, Tom, and of course, many others on Herodotus and Homer. So in what follows, I try to join these efforts and to broaden the perspective even more. Herodotus's narrator, I would say, creates something like a literary cosmos populated with past representatives of poetry and literature like stars in the sky. The fact that the histories mention a large number of older poets has long been acknowledged, of course. Besides Homer, there are, for example, Hesiod, Sappho, Archaeus, and Hecataeus. Herodotus mentions an astonishing number of poets whom we still recognize today as representatives of early Greek poetry. These include poets working in the fields of epic, elegy, choral poetry, lyric poetry in the strict sense, but also writers engaged in mythography and early prose. At the same time, it should be noted that the histories is not the first text to mention other authors by name. To be sure, as early as Archaeus, and here we have the text of fragment 384 local page, we find a referent to the violet-haired, holy, sweetly smiling Sappho, his contemporary from Lesbos. Similarly, when the Odyssey refers to the first ship, as the much song of, that means the famous Argo, this too should be taken as an even earlier reference to knowledge of corresponding poetry. Still, 
Herodotus's histories, with their extraordinary number of references to earlier poets and texts, present something different, something new. Indeed, what the Herodotian narrator presents over the course of his work is a literary selection that is formulated here for the first time. This selection reflects to an astonishing degree to the authors and the text that have been considered canonical since Hellenistic times. To put it bluntly, this is the first time we encounter evidence of an awareness of the Greek way of life as a literary culture. This developing awareness of one's own literature and poetry in a way corresponds to Herodotus's historical awareness, which Felix Jacobi in his, let's say, sometimes outdated, but in some respects still valid um, uh, description um, as developing in the course of Herodotus' work on the histories. It is interesting to note that Herodotus's references to early Greek poets and prose authors, prose authors are not limited to any single episode or context, but are spread throughout the entire work. Here we see an overview of the authors and texts mentioned by Herodotus, organized by the book in which they appear. And I tried to, to um, put the names in the correct English version. Uh, if I have mistaken some names, I, I apologize. This impressive lists, uh, list here raises some questions that, as far as I can see, have not been asked before. First, did the selection provided by Herodotus already exist, or was it Herodotus himself who selected these authors and these texts? And second, which authors does Herodotus not mention, and why does he not mention them? Let's start with the first question, namely, whether Herodotus adopted the canon of poets found in his work from elsewhere, or whether he perhaps created it himself. The first thing that strikes is that the poets mentioned all belong to past Greek poetry. Herodotus does not quote any contemporaries. This may be due to the oral character of much poetry, even in the fifth century, Apart from names such as Orpheus, Linus, and Mosaius, which are difficult to categorize chronologically, the Herodotian selection covers the period from the 7th to the 5th, early 5th century, and this is roughly from Homer to Aeschylus. In some cases, such as with Aesop, the reference in Herodotus is the first ever mention of the author by name. The existence of something like canonization efforts as early as the fifth century seems plausible in light of scenes such as those from Plato's dialogue Protagoras, composed around 30 to 40 years after Herodotus. In the Protagoras, Plato's Socrates argues with the sophist Protagoras about the correct interpretation of a passage from the poet Simonides. Throughout, the passage is assumed to be familiar to Socrates, Protagoras, and to Plato's fourth century audience. This suggests the existence of a pre-existing canon, which is, however, merely conjectural. Certain early, certain early canonization efforts can also be plausibly assumed for poetry performed in the public, including drama and choral poetry. Because of their public performative character, these plays would have been familiar to large parts of the population. However, there is nothing to suggest that Herodotus had at his disposal a wider pre-existing canon, including not only choral poetry, for example, Pindar, and tragedy, for example, Aeschylus and Phrynichus but also love poetry, melic poetry, or the other forms of early Greek poetry. In fact, it was the Hellenistic project of collection, selection, and commentary 
that seems to have created the famous canons, including, for instance, the canon of the nine lyric poets, the three th th um, tra tragedians, and the five epic poets. Accordingly, in drafting something like a proto-canon of older Greek poetry in his histories, Herodotus does not appear to have simply received and incorporated an already existing canon. Instead, he seems to have significantly anticipated and possibly helped shape the later Alexandrian canons. None of their names mentioned by Herodotus, with the possible exception of Phrynichus, fell into oblivion in the further course of antiquity. On the contrary, Herodotus's canon of selections represents, at least in name, something like the nucleus of all later collections compiled in antiquity and later in modern times. Such an initial selection, it seems, was decisive for later literary developments. For what was once part of the proto-canon remained a part of the tradition and thus persisted in general consciousness. This brings us to the second question, namely, of what texts Herodotus not mentioned. If one were to teach a seminar on early Greek poetry today, and I taught one just recently, then in addition to the poets mentioned by Herodotus, one would certainly also cover Bacchulides, Alcman, Tertius and Kalinus, Mumnermus and Theognis, Stesichorus and Hipponax. Why doesn't Herodotus mention any of them? An answer to this question is obviously and necessarily speculative. In other words, it is impossible to say whether or not Herodotus was aware of these poets at all, though his ignorance of them does not seem very likely. It is also doubtful whether Herodotus's audience noticed the absence of an Tertius or Mimnamus. But on closer inspection, we may discern the outlines of something like a criterion that a poet must meet before being mentioned in the histories and thus included in Herodotus's literary canon. There is a striking correlation between originating from the Athenian Union area and being mentioned by Herodotus. It should be noted that some poets who are not mentioned, such as Galenus of Ephesus or Mimnamus of Smyrna, are of Ionian origin and thus do fulfill this criterion. Conversely, however, it is true that none of the poets who came from Sparta, like Tertius and Alcman, or from Spartan areas of influence, such as Hipponax of Region and Stesichorus of Himera, both places in Sicily, are mentioned in Herodotus. The question therefore arises, of whether this is simply a coincidence or whether something like an organizing hand is at work here. If the selection is intentional, what is the reason behind it and what function could it have fulfilled? Is the selection based on dialect? Is it perhaps made in favor of the Ionian dialect and to the detriment of the Doric? Are the considerations political? To my mind, to my mind, dialect does not seem to be decisive since Doric was familiar across the Greek speaking world, as in fact was also Herodotus himself, who is said to have appeared before large pan Hellenic assemblies, such as that in Olympia. A political interpretation seems more plausible. If we are to assume that the histories were largely composed in the 1420s, uh, 420s, 430s, 420s, as I guess many of us now do, then contemporary developments such as the increasing alienation between Athens and Sparta 
and their respective allies may have played a role. In any case, all the poets mentioned come from areas that belonged to the Delian League in Herodotus' day. Interestingly, questions persist concerning the political allegiance of places of origin of some poets not mentioned by Herodotus. Examples include Megara, the birthplace of Theognis, Himera, Stesichorus, and Region, Ibicus. In addition to Sparta itself, the hometown of Tertius and Alcman, some cities, such as Megara, Himera, and Region, fought on the side of the Greeks at the time of the Persian Wars and were also part of the Delian League, but took Sparta's side at the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War or in the course of it, and this means at the time when the histories were probably written. And I realized that um, Liz is in the audience. Okay. These interesting considerations have thus far gone undetected and deserve further investigation with open results. If true, the thesis I have here outlined would have considerable implications for Herodotus' research. Firstly, the Athenian Union tendency of Herodotus's literary canon suggests that Herodotus had certain sympathies in the political affairs of his time, thus bearing on an old and very controversial issue we are all familiar with. Moreover, the fact that Herodotus does not mention someone like Ibicus, who comes from Region, a city which came to serve as an Athenian naval base in the course of the Peloponnesian War, this means presumably after Herodotus's death, may be relevant to questions of internal dating and other contentious issue in Herodotus' research. These questions, however, should be reserved for future studies, especially since they touch on problems in ancient history that would best be pursued in an interdisciplinary manner. So this is just a glimpse. An issue which is of immediate relevance in the context of this paper, however, is the relation of Herodotus to later developments of the poetic canon, especially those that took place in Alexandria. This canon formation was not only an expression of the Alexandrians' appreciation or lack of appreciation for certain authors. It also represented the first bottleneck for the transmission of ancient texts. In order to survive into later antiquity, and ideally also into the Middle Ages and modern times, an archaic or classical text had first to pass muster with the scholars in Alexandria. But was the Alexandrian eye of the needle already preceded by a Herodotian eye of the needle? Well, certainly not when it comes to concrete textual transmission. After all, Herodotus, as far as we know, did not have a library of the texts he mentioned, which would have later become part of the Alexandrian collection. But the histories may have posed such an early bottleneck in so far as the text presented something as the text presented something like a first selection or a proto-canon, so to speak, a first seal of approval. In any case, the selection made by Herodotus has endured ever since, a circumstance that has been strangely neglected so far. However, something else is striking in the relationship between the Alexandrians and Herodotus. And this observation brings me to the final part of my paper. Namely, the interesting connection between the histories and the muses. Book one is named after Cleo, book two after Euterpe, and so on and so on. We all know it. The Herodotian work was divided into nine books in the first century BC at the latest. At any rate, Diodorus was the first to mention such a division into nine books in the first century BC. The fact that these nine books 
had been named after the nine muses since Hellenistic times is attested by Lucian. Uh, it's, is it Lucian or Lucian? Lucian, I guess. Um, who remarks on this in his essay, How to Write History, composed in the second century AD. It is possible that the naming of the nine Herodotian books goes back to the Alexandrian philologist Aristarchus of Samothraki, who was probably the first to write a commentary on Herodotus in the second century BC. In his History of Classical uh, Scholarship, Rudolf Pfeiffer provides a good overview of what we know about this first commentary on Herodotus. What remains unexplained, however, both in modern research and in ancient literature, is why Herodotus's nine books were named after the nine muses. Was this label simply motivated by the number nine, nine books, nine muses, or is there more to it than that? I would like to suggest that my earlier remarks about Herodotus's formation of the proto-canon of Greek and European literary history should be applied to this question. It seems to me that the Alexandrian philologists who instituted the division of the work into nine books and subsequently named these after the muses had a very keen sense as they do as they often do for the contents of Herodotus's text, often, uh, often overlooked to this day. They recognized that this text contains a synopsis of Greek poetry and early prose that can hardly be expressed more beautifully than by reference to the nine muses. If we take a closer look, we will even find that the muses reflect the genres of nearly all the texts mentioned by Herodotus, from the epic to individual and choral poetry, love poetry and tragedy, astronomy and philosophy. Given the poetic and literary panopticon contained in the Herodotian text, the naming of the nine muses, uh, the naming of the nine books after the muses may be the best testimony to the experimental character of the histories in this respect. The histories thus not only describe numerous forms of cultural contact and redraw the dimensions of geographical and cultural landscapes, they also survey the literary cosmos of the polis, perhaps for the first time, and employ it to put forward um, a definition of Hellenic identity. In Herodotus, cultural history is something like literary history. At the very least, Herodotus defines what is to be Greek, and he does so to a considerable extent by taking up and playing with his own literary tradition. Thanks a lot.